Okay, so welcome everybody to the special year seminar on theoretical machine learning at the Institute for Advanced Study. We are delighted to have a in as first year. Apo is a professor at University of Helsinki and her fundamental contributions to unsupervised learning, general models, and algorithms. He's best known for the invention of the fast independent component analysis algorithm and the method of score matching for primary estimation in general models, as well as the co-invention of noise contrastive estimation, which inspired the development of gen general adversarial nets. He's a CIFAR fellow and action editor of the Journal of Machine Learning Research and Neural Computation, an editorial board member of Foundations and Trends in Machine Learning, and an author of two books on independent component analysis and natural image statistics. Today, Apo will tell us about nonlinear independent component analysis. Please welcome Apo Hibardini. Thanks very much for the nice introduction and thank you very much for inviting me <coughs> here so I can present my work. So, yes, I will be talking about nonlinear independent component analysis, which obviously is uh, based on my previous work or many people's previous work on independent component analysis, but this, this time in a very nonlinear way. So, I will first make a very short introduction to deep learning. Well, maybe that is actually not particularly very necessary for this audience, but well, just to kind of introduce the basic concepts. Then I will try to emphasize the importance of unsupervised learning as opposed to, super, to the ordinary supervised learning. In particular, in people often these days talk about uh, disentanglement, which is a reasonably ill-defined term, meaning, but it means something like finding independent factors in your data in an unsupervised way. Now, in the linear case, we actually know that independent component analysis is does that quite successfully. So it would be very uh, attractive to be able if we were able to actually extend that to a completely nonlinear method. But this is actually a well-known idea, I mean an, an old idea, but it's actually extremely difficult. It turns out that a simple extension of, of ICA to the nonlinear case is fundamentally ill-defined. It is not identifiable. Identifiability is a key concept in this talk. But I will propose two solutions which we have found quite recently. Uh, one, which is actually has two parts, is to use various kinds of temporal structure in time series. And the second, which is kind of a generalization of the first, is to use some kind of a additional variable, which we call auxiliary variable, such as, for example, we might use audio data for video. And in these two cases, we get actually identifiability for the model. Now then, after those theoretical results, then we can talk about estimation methods. I will emphasize two approaches here. One is self-supervised uh, methods, and the other one is based on a variation of autoencoders. So, um, well, just a couple of introductory slides. We all know then much about the success of artificial intelligence in various applications like machine translation, game playing, possibly autonomous vehicles, and so on and so on. And most of these modern applications really are based on deep learning. What deep learning means is that we use neural networks, neural networks being defined as something where we basically make as, as a kind of a recursive system, if you like, where you, where you have many layers, with each layer making a linear transformation by these coefficients w i, i j, and then a pointwise uh, scalar uh, nonlinearity, such as this uh, well known uh, rectifying, uh, rectifying nonlinearity. And the idea being, uh, well, the advantage being that then this kind of a system can approximate basically any kind of nonlinear input output mappings, that is a universal approximation capability. <clears throat> and then when we add to this some kind of a statistical objective, such as perhaps simply least squares in a regression setting then we can learn all kinds of nonlinear functions. Now, what deep learning means typically is that we learn a neural network with many layers. Well, not typically, that's kind of the definition actually, but nobody knows exactly what many means here. So what we have seen in various applications is that when you just have enough data, that's uh, important to have enough, enough data, then this is kind of a system can basically learn any kind of an input output relationship in a kind of a regression setting. Uh, 
It can associate images, input images with categories. Perhaps in a prediction setting, it can associate past values with present values. And well, in a some, somewhat um, unpleasant application, perhaps it can associate it can associate your Facebook friends with your political views. The present boom was, was <clears throat> as most of you probably know, started by this paper by Grzewski, Sutskever and Hinton in 2012, where they associated images with categories. So given input images, it can basically tell, give a category output, that is, it can tell you what kind of an object is in the image. And this was much better than anything, uh, any systems that had been uh, used earlier. And well, uh, so it became extremely, uh, ha had an extreme impact. And on a more general level, then the impact was really to show that by simply learning, you can actually have higher, higher intelligence in a certain sense than what you would have by various kinds of handicrafted systems. Okay, but uh, all those success stories typically are based on, on, on using some kind of a category labels. Well, okay, there's also reinforcement learning, but I'm kind of ignoring that here. These, uh, the, the things that I just mentioned, they need category labels or some kind of an output, so that for each image you have to know whether there's a cat or a dog or whatever category there may be in the image, or whether some kind of a, uh, some kind of a, well, um, Facebook item was liked or not liked. But then, of course, <coughs> this approach has many problems in the sense that you might actually not have those labels. It may be very difficult to obtain any kind of any kinds of uh, meaningful labels. Often, you need human annotation, like with images. You may need humans that tell what is in the images, actually, which is ex very expensive and uh, costly. Sorry, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's expensive. And it can also be that the labels that you get are in the end not very informative. They are perhaps too vague, too general. So this brings us to the question of, uh, on, of unsupervised learning. So in unsupervised learning, we simply observe a data vector, so which is taken as a random vector in a, in a probabilistic setting, where and we have no labels, no target outputs, Y associated to them. So basically, it's like having photographs of various cats and dogs and so on, but having no labels that tell us what is in the images. Well, I think people would agree in the field that unsupervised learning is, is a very difficult problem, much more difficult than, than supervised learning, and it's largely on an unsolved problem. Well, um, yes, my favorite uh, approach for unsupervised learning is independent component analysis, which has been quite successful in the linear case. So I will now review the linear independent component analysis setting. Well, <clears throat> here we denote by x i k the uh, the observations where i is the uh, index of the observed variable or, or signal, if you like, and k is some kind of a sample index, which may may be time, but it can also be the, well, any arbitrary sample index, like the index of an individual in a, in a biomedical setting. Uh, so now what we try to do is by simply observing these x's, we try to decompose it into two parts. One is latent variables Sj and a mixing matrix Aij. So the Aij basically uh, tell you how these latent variables are mixed together in order to get the observed variable. Now, the key point in ICA is that we assume that these uh, latent variables Sj are not only statistically independent, but they are also non-Gaussian. Now, what happens in that case is that ICA is identifiable. So what identifiability means is that the model is well-defined in the following sense, which is that by observing only these Xs, uh, we can actually recover both the A's and the S's. So it is really unsupervised, unsupervised learning in the sense that we only observe the X's, no targets or whatever, but then we can actually recover both the A's and the S's. So this is kind of an old result going back to around 1950, but it was basically revived by some people working in signal processing like Como in, uh, in the 90s, and they built a kind of modern, modern theory of independent component analysis. 
Now, I, I need to emphasize the fundamental difference between ICA and PCA. Sometimes, sometimes people think it's almost the same thing because the acronyms are almost the same, but fundamentally it's actually very, these two very different things. Now, the point is, here's a very simple illustration where we have two independent components with uniform distributions. The scatter plot would look like this. Uh, here, the components have uniform distributions, so the joint distribution is uniform inside a square. Now the observed mixtures, that the, so the observed data that we find, uh, that we get, could look like this, after, which is a linear transformation of the original components. Now if we do, if we do PCA and normalize the variances, we get something like this, which is clearly not the same thing that we had in the beginning. But then the point in ICA is that we actually get the original components. Now perhaps on some intuitive level, Having this kind of a very strong non uh, sorry, having this kind of a very strong non Gaussianity in the form of uniform distributions will give you an idea of why ICA will be able to find the right components because it can kind of see the square and rotate it in the right direction. And this is something that methods like PCA and classical Gaussian factor analysis are really not able to do. The reason being that if you if the data were Gaussian then any orthogonal rotation is, has exactly the same distribution. So assuming you have uh, Gaussian variables which are independent and uh, have standardized, are standardized unit variables. I'm trying to kind of plot it here, but it's a bit difficult to plot. But the point is that, well, uh, it is reasonably well known that the distribution, uh, such a distribu Gaussian distribution is completely rotationally invariant. So that is why we say, that Gaussian, uh, a Gaussian model of factor analysis or also PCA are not identifiable. You, can, because there, you cannot find the right, correct uh, orthogonal transformation. As is seen here, PCA will give you kind of a random orthogonal rotation of the original components. So what this means, what another uh, one, a more practical viewpoint to identifiability is that, it can, that ICA can do something called blind source separation. So here we have four observed signals. Uh, so they are um, simultaneously observed parallel time series. Now, if we do PCA on them, we will not get anything reasonable, uh, kind of meaningful looking. But actually, if we do ICA, we can act find that these four, com four signals were actually linear combinations, linear superpositions of these four original and meaningful looking signals. Now, this is extremely useful in certain a, uh, application areas such as uh, brain imaging. Um, I will not go into details, but here's just a nice picture from one of our papers, where basically now the sources are electro electrical sources in the brain, different brain regions basically. And what we, op what we measure by various devices such as EEG or MEG, we op measure something outside of the head which is necessarily complicated linear mixtures. Complete, um, it's basically, the sources are completely mixed up in the measurements that you get outside of the head. But now, I, with ICA, we can actually find your, separate those original sources, and we can actually find components, some of which are well-known, uh, well-known brain sources, while others are less well-known. And so this is very interesting from the viewpoint of exploratory data analysis maybe those that we don't actually understand immediately are some new brain sources that people don't yet know, know much about. You can also do image feature extraction by the same uh, model of ICA. You just take images or, or small patches of images in practice perhaps, and input those, say that each image is one data point. And so then you will find basically uh, uh, linear features of your images here. I'm showing a uh, like collection of such images where each small panel is one, one feature, basically one column of the mixing matrix. It's like, it's like dictionary learning. I mean, dictionary learning, if you are more familiar with that term, is, a, is more or less the same thing as ICA. In fact. So we get features which are similar to wavelets or Gabor functions, and in fact, similar to simple cells in the primary visual core. Right, so it would be really nice now if we could very simply, kind of in a straightforward way, if we were able to extend this ICA framework to a completely nonlinear case. So we would get, we would actually solve 
to some extent at least this problem of disentanglement that people often talk about in, uh, in deep learning. But unfortunately, well, now we, then we run into this problem of uh, identifiability, lack of identifiability. If we simply say that each observed variable xi is some arbitrary, completely general function of the independent components, then, well, this model is simply not identifiable, uh, identifiable in the sense that we can find many different functions f that give uh, expressed the x as a function of some independent components. He, here's a simple illustration. So this is an old result that goes back to uh, Darmois, 1952. So we kind of revived that in, uh, in uh, some 20 years ago. So here's a simple illustration. We have two independent components. Here's a scatter plot where the colors are simply for the purposes of illustration. Now we make a, a, a nonlinear mixture, well, two nonlinear mixtures of these independent components. And as you can see, well, this is clearly something which is a very nonlinear function of these original sources. Now we can actually find uh, two components which have exactly the same distributions as the original sources. So they are statistically completely indistinguishable from the original sources. But clearly, they are not equal to the original sources. If you look at the coloring, you see that clearly this, 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 these, are not, these, these two sources are not the same as the two ones. Uh, these two estimates of sources are not the same as the two original sources. So um, now I will very briefly explain the basic idea here, which, is, uh, which was proposed by Darwin in, in 52. Now, the point is that. Suppose you have two variables, random variables x1 and x2. We can always construct a new random variable uh, denoted by y such that it is independent of x1. It is, this is simply possible by looking at the conditional, uh, sorry, uh, conditional cumulative distribution function. Fixing x1 x to some value, we just look at the CD, a conditional CD. And well, it's not very difficult to say, see that x1 and y are independent because basically now the distribution, conditional distribution of, 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 of this uh, y is always uniform. So it doesn't actually depend on x1 at, and at, at, uh, it doesn't depend on x1 at all. And by definition, x1 and, and y are thus independent. So independence alone is clearly too weak for any kind of identifiability. Because if we just suppose we only want to find two components, two functions of the data which are independent. Now we could say that, okay, let's take x1 as one of those independent components and then this y as the other independent component. In other words, one of the observed variables can be defined to be one of the latent variables, which is completely absurd. Uh, equally, <coughs> well, a, a key point in nonlinear, uh, sorry, a key point in ICA which I didn't emphasize very much, but anyway, is to look at the non-Gaussianity of the components. But it is also completely absurd, absurd here because a scalar transform of any variable can give you any non-linear distribution, sorry, any non-Gaussian distribution. So looking at non-Gaussianity is, is, it doesn't actually help at all either. So I, in fact, the illustration I had on the previous slide with sources, mixtures, and bad estimates is given by this Darmoir construction. So that's why we know that we have here exactly the same distributions as if and exactly independent components. Okay, so uh, at this point it may sound like, okay, I have basically said that uh, the rest of the talk is nonsense because I'm saying that the nonlinear ICA is completely impossible, but it's not completely impossible. It is only impossible under these assumptions here, which the assumptions that are implicit here, which is basically the assumption of IID sampling. I'm assuming that X1 and X2 are simply random variables. But now, <clears throat> suppose that X1 and X2, so the date observed data, is not random variables, but time series. Then actually the situation is completely different. And that's kind of the, the kind of key point in this talk, at least the first half, the half, first half of the talk that if we have time series, then the situation is different. We can have identifiability. Well, 
we are uh, we are actually talking about he talking here about two different kinds of uh, of uh, time series, two different kinds of temporal structure. First, simple autocorrelations or temporal dependencies. It was proposed already by uh, to, in 2003 by Harmeling and others that this might help, uh, this might enable nonlinear ICA, although they didn't have, they had a heuristic algorithm, but no proof. Now, uh, more recently, we showed that also the property of non-stationarity can enable uh, identification of the model. So here's a simple illustration of what non-stationary components might look like. So here's a Here's, here's a non-stationary. Here's a non here's, Here are non-stationary signals in the sense that, like the variance of the component is changing very much. Um, excuse me. I have to ask: Is the audio still working fine? Because my microphone is giving me some error signals. Uh, it is working fine. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, yeah. So. Uh, so this we have. We have two different kinds of uh, of um, of temporal structure. And in fact, we can prove identifiability of nonlinear ICA in the two cases. So that's most of the rest of this talk. Identifiability, I'm reminding you, means that we can actually find the original sources. Now, uh, I will be using a lot an algorithmic trick called self-supervised learning. In fact, this is really just a kind of a, a random trick in a sense. It does, there's no logical connection between self-supervised learning and nonlinear ICA or identifiability. It just happens that certain self-supervised learning methods are, are easy to uh, work well in this setting and are easy to analyze. So <clears throat> I will explain what self-supervised means. So in supervised learning, of course, we have input X and output Y, such as images and then some labels giving the content. While in unsupervised learning, we only have X, the input. Now, self-supervised learning means that we initially actually only have input X, but then we invent ourselves, ourselves some kind of Y. There's many different heuristic ways that have been proposed in the literature. For example, by creating corrupted data and uh, saying that maybe Y, uh, one of these X and Y is perhaps corrupted data. Uh, sorry, that's a bit... Um, uh, a confusing explanation. But anyway, we invent some kind of a Y and then we use supervised learning algorithms. So in computer vision, people are really enthusiastic about this method or this, this principle and they have a huge number of different methods. So a very, very simple one might be that, that when you have photographs, you remove some part of the photograph and then learn to predict the missing part by the remaining part. Uh, so, in that case, presumably, well, the idea in this kind of self-supervised learning is that some kind, of, if you train a neural network to do this, uh, to perform this task, then the neural network has to learn something interesting about the structure of your data in order to perform this self-supervised learning task. Okay, so, <clears throat> so basically, our research on nonlinear ICA started in by investigating a completely heuristically proposed algorithm. So we, we, proposed, we proposed heuristically a self-supervised learning algorithm, but then found out that it's actually theoretically extremely interesting in the sense of doing nonlinear ICA and in the process proving identifiability. So the starting point is that we observe an n-dimensional time series, kind of illustrated here. What we do is that we divide this time series into a large number of segments. In the basic case, by just taking perhaps bins with equal sizes. Then what we do is that we tra train a multi-layer perceptron so that it, it will tell for each single data point which segment the data point comes from. So it's a classical multinomial classi uh, classification task where the number of classes is equal to the number of segments each of each original data point is also a data point in this new classification uh, setting. And this can be solved by classic, well, very, very well known theory of multinomial logistic regression in the neural network, where we can actually then divide the neural network into two parts. First, the feature extractor, which kind of is kind of everything until the last hidden layer, 
and then the last layer which performs the multinomial logistic regression which is not really uh, the interesting part here what we are interested here in here in is the feature extraction part now, if you think about what this kind of a system should be learning, <clears throat> well, basically the hidden layer, the last hidden layer, should somehow learn to represent the non-stationarity in the data, because non-stationarity is by definition the difference of the distributions between the segments. It is exactly the information that the system needs to be able to tell for each data point which segment it comes from. So, can this actually do nonlinear ICA? Well, it actually can. We have a theorem. <clears throat> I will go through it in, in some detail. Well, actually, a special case of the theorem. So we start by assuming that the data actually follows the nonlinear ICA model. That's, that's kind of necessary. Otherwise, we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot talk about identifiability at all. So the data follows the nonlinear ICA model with a smooth, invertible nonlinear mixing. But otherwise, we don't actually restrict the nonlinearity in any way. And, but, and now, importantly, we assume that the components are non-stationary. So this is the key point. We assume that the components have a suitable temporal, st temporal structure as opposed to being IID something. In, in the basic, basic case that I'm considering here, I'm talking about this uh, non-stationarity of variances that I illustrated a couple of slides ago, but it's, this is much more general. Than that. Now, assume that on this kind of data we apply the time contrastive learning so that the number of hidden units in the last hidden layer equals the number of data points. Uh, in fact, I should mention, well, the number of independent components equals the number of uh, observed variables. And so that is now assumed to be uh, equal to the number of hidden units. Then <clears throat> we can prove that DC TCL in the limit of infinite data and assuming universal approximation capability and so on, it will actually find the following. It will find that the squares of the independent components are equal to some unknown linear transformation of the hidden layer outputs. So what it means is that TCL basically demixes the nonlinear ICM model. It finds the, the independent components up to a linear mixing and up to the squaring. But now, fortunately, under some further assumptions, the linear mixing can actually be estimated by linear ICA because it's only a linear mixing. So we essentially get a constructive proof of identifiability at the same time. We have, we, we, by proving the convergence of the algorithm, we prove that we can actually identify, identify the independent components. Up to squaring, as a first step in the paper, we actually uh, argue that, well, even that squaring can be resolved. Right. <clears throat> so, yes, so this, this was our uh, main, uh, our first main result on identifiability of nonlinear ICA. Now, if we think about it from an intuitive viewpoint, so why would this actually work? We saw that simply saying that let's have let's train a neural network to give us independent variables. That doesn't work because there's a huge amount of uh, various kinds of in independent variables that you can obtain, and they are all, statistically speaking, equally good. But what we have here is that we actually, due to non-stationarity, we can actually impose this independence at every segment, in principle, at every time point. So we have many more constraints, and in the end, when you have enough constraints, you have a unique solution to the problem, and that is identifiability. Okay. So um, I have a question here um, yep. about um, the definition of H. Um, is that the MLP that is optimal in some sense? Um, like is that- Yeah, so, so it, it is the MLP after learning. I so see. the hidden um, units, uh, the outputs of the last uh, of the last hidden units in the MLP after learning. Right, um, and this is on a finite sample, or is it in? Oh, no, no, this is infinite. Yeah, yeah, I mean this is the limit of infinite data. Okay, thank you. And also we assume that 
you know, we, since we are assuming that F can be anything, uh, mm -hmm. there's no restriction on the functional class, we have to also assume that, well, uh, we have universal approximation capability, uh, which, well, in principle means that the neural network has to be infinite. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this is all, yeah, you know, uh, limits of infin in, the in, 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 in infinity. Okay, so that is the case of non-stationary data. It turns out that we can actually figure out uh, a self-supervised learning method that solves the problem uh, for a case of stationary time series, which, which means then a uh, time series which have some kind of temporal dependencies. Again, I emphasize that there's no logical connection, no, there's no log logical necessity to have self-supervised learning, and not even really any kind of logical connection why self-supervised learning would work well for nonlinear ICA? It's just kind of a kind of a, um, a coincidence. I would say. Okay, so let's consider a stationary time series again, n-dimensional stationary time series, and let's devise the following kind of a self-supervised learning problem. We take short time windows as the new data in the well, kind of simply very simplest case, just uh, windows of two time points, two consecutive time points. And then we create uh, another data set where we just randomly time permit the data. So we basically take two data points from completely unrelated time, po uh, time points and put them together as a kind of a contrastive data set. It's, this is related to what people call negative sampling, which is um, another heuristic idea related uh, where people do similar stuff. And now we train the neural network to discriminate uh, between these two, data, uh, these two data sets. Again, so that we have like a feature extractor working up to the last hidden layer. And then after that, we have some uh, less interesting, like the final logistic regression. Uh, now I will not go into any details here, <clears throat> but we can actually prove, we can have a similar theorem as we, uh, to what we had before that we can show that this actually performs nonlinear ICA when the components have certain, uh, uh, certain kinds of temporal dependencies. For example, autocorrelations or perhaps some uh, non-Gaussian, um, I, mean, I mean, they could be simply Gaussian with autocorrelations or they could have various kinds of uh, uh, non-Gaussian uh, dependencies. So I will just show an example so, here. So we have a uh question from the audience. Oh, right. Uh, what happens if um, the number of independent components is not the same as the dimension of X? Ah, yes. Well, that's kind of a, the, the, the ubiquitous question in ICA. Uh, so one part of the answer is that, well, um, even in the linear case, we basically do all the theory, uh, almost all the theory, in the case where the numbers are equal, because it's so much, more, uh, so much simpler in that case. Um, now, if the number of independent components is less than the number of, uh, than the dimension of X, then, well, a simple kind of a heuristic idea as, is to first do PCA and then ICA. This is what basically everybody does in the linear case. You could do the same thing in the nonlinear case, but we will act, I will actually have a bit later, a bit later, um, um, uh, some uh, theory for that case. In fact, in the paper on TCL, uh, we do consider the case where we have less independent components and we can actually show some, something meaningful, some meaningful kind of a dimension reduction. Now, if the number of independent components is greater than the number of, uh, of observed variables, then things are really complicated. Like this is also known in, in the linear ICA case. And in the nonlinear case, we don't really we don't really have much results. Maybe in one of our very newest papers, we have something a bit related uh, in it with using energy-based modeling, but that's, but that's not exactly nonlinear ICA. So um, I, I would say at this point that if the, uh, that the case where we have more independent components is, is an open problem uh, in, for nonlinear ICA. But yes, that's, that's a very essential question. Thank you. Uh, okay, so another question. The formulation of the learning task seems crucial to the type of dependence one can resolve. Is Ah, yeah, yeah, I will have that in a couple of slides. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, so uh, I will just first show this um, uh, illustration <coughs> of uh, permutation contrastive learning. So uh, a simple case of a nonlinear non uh, temporally de uh, dependent component would be to, to take uh, an autoregressive model, linear autoregressive model uh, with non-Gaussian innovations. So like here we have basically uh, Laplacian innovations in, uh, in a simple uh, first order autoregressive model. Uh, now, <clears throat> here we have the sources, which actually are exactly what I showed earlier. I, I showed earlier exactly the same data as the sources and the mixtures. I just didn't mention that they actually came, that we actually created them in, in terms of this time series. So, uh, earlier we failed because we didn't take the time dependencies into account. But now, with a PCL, well, we get a pretty good correspondence to the earlier ones. Here are scatter plots of the real source signals and the estimates, and you see that, well, there's a quite a good correspondence. For comparison, we use this method, the uh, early method by Harmeling and others, which was quite heuristic and so on, and well, clearly it, the performance is not that good for that method. Okay. Um, right, so here's the, uh, the answer to, uh, the, to the question by Jeremias. So we had one model for non-stationary data and one for temporal dependencies. So two kind of completely orthogonal assumptions. So what can we do in the general case? Well, I, I think we can actually do many things in the general case. In some earlier papers, we had uh, AS, that's, AS that's 2019, we had some proposal how we could basically do a kind of a self-supervised method with randomization, including both the non-stationarities uh, and the temporal dependencies, but we didn't actually have any um, real analysis or experiments on that. More re uh, so there's certainly many ways, many ways of, of combining this in a principled way, and uh, I, don't, I don't pretend that we have any kind of a final solution at all. No, but uh, I, we have just very promising uh, stuff uh, that we just put an archive uh, a couple of months ago, where the idea is that let's assume we have an autoregressive model where the innovations are non-stationary. So that will naturally combine non-stationarities and temporal dependencies. And we get very good results, at least on uh, brain imaging data. Another question that kind of immediately pops up here is that, okay, so in TCL, you, we somehow segment the data. And I was saying that, well, in the simplest case, we just take bins with equal sizes. Uh, so basically we are doing it manually, um, which is certainly not optimal. Well, recently, uh, very recently, actually, we proposed a method where we have a, a hidden Markov model that kind of, uh, so that we can, so we combine TCL with a hidden Markov model so that we can actually then learn, uh, the, um, learn the segmentation at the same time. Well, we, we combine, we, we use the, T, the model implicit in TCL, but we go into a maximum likelihood framework. That's why we can actually easily and in a principled way combine it with the uh, HMS. Okay, um, yeah, and another stuff that we have been doing very recently is that you can actually, that, well, these methods um, ML, based on MLE and logistic regression and so on, they can be sometimes sensitive to outliers. So we used a kind of a, an alternative divergence to what is typically used the, to the classical uh, logistic regression objective function, and that leads to much more robust methods in terms of outliers. Right. Okay, so now I will go to a more general framework, which will also generalize what we had previously. Well, we can first, uh, well, if we really look at the very, very general <laughs> framework uh, that is well known in the literature, the big picture, because people talk about deep latent variable models. So we have latent variables uh, S or latent vector S, and we have an observed data vector. And in general, then people just say that, well, we have some kind of an observation equation here, the conditional distribution of X given S. Uh, and well, of course, then we, uh, that, that's how we get the joint distribution and we can integrate up S. Now, this kind of a framework is, of course, extremely general, but 
some particular instantiations are widely used, in particular variational autoencoders. Variational autoencoders basically defines here that the uh, distribution of S of S is white and Gaussian. Uh, in other words, Gaussian with an uh, e with each entry independent, mutually independent. And they define also the posterior uh, or this observation equation so that basically x equals some nonlinear function of S plus n. And in fact, here. Uh, there was a question, uh, oh yes, um, um, uh, uh, kind of a uh, one more point on, on that question, on the question of different numbers of, uh, of uh, different numbers of uh, di different dimensions for X and S. Here, there is no reason why S should be smaller, uh, dimension of S should be smaller than dimension of X. In fact, the, the dimension of S, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I, sorry, I mixed it up. There is no reason why the dimensions of S and X should be equal. In fact, the dimension of S is usually less than the dimension of X. So in fact, if you look at this equation, it looks very much like nonlinear ICA. We just have this noise term added here, but even in linear ICA, people will sometimes add this noise, uh, which some people then call dictionary learning, but it's kind of the same thing anyway. But this basic method, basic framework of variational autoencoders auto is clearly not identifiable. We have the same indeterminacy as earlier in the case of linear ICA when I compared linear ICA with linear PCA and linear factor analysis and that kind of stuff. Due to Gaussianity, which is assumed almost basically almost always in the VAEs, any orthogonal rotation, uh, due to Gaussianity and independence, any orthogonal rotation of this uh, of S will actually have exactly the same distribution. And so it is statistically indistinguishable. So at the very least, this orthogonal rotation is completely indetermined. In fact, the theorem by Darmois, uh, the, the Darmois construction from 1952, will show that you actually get many more indeterminacies as well. This is just kind of the easiest. easiest. In, in the nonlinear case, it is kind of expected. Uh, you actually get much more indeterminacies than in the linear case. So this is what you would get even in the linear case, but it's, it's not all. So what can we do? <clears throat> well, we can look at an idea that has been, well, that was proposed earlier uh, heuristically by uh, Arangelovic and Zisserman, which is that we basically look at, uh, we condition uh, the data by some other observed variable. Um, in the case of the his, his results by uh, Arangelovic and Zisserman, so what they wanted to do is video feature extraction or basically image feature extraction. And what they had was, uh, was video data and co uh, and combined with audio. So then they basically built a neural network that looks at how, well, how, how, the, uh, how the audio kind of conditions the, uh, the video and, 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 well, sorry, I kind of, <laughs> I'm unable to explain all the details, but they found out that using this audio will actually greatly improve the uh, feature extraction of video. Now in our framework, we could use that idea by, by, by simply talking about conditioning. So we assume that we assume that we observe another variable denoted here by u, which modulates the components so that the, the, the uh, conditional density of each independent component will change when, com when modulated by this additional variable u. So this u corresponds now to the audio if we want to have um, uh, uh, do image feature extraction. But in fact, the two cases of temporal structure that we saw earlier, they can both be expressed in this framework as well. If we talk about non-stationarity, then we just define this U as the time index. The very definition of non-stationarity is that the PDF changes when conditioned by, uh, as, as a function of T. And various kinds of autocorrelations and temporal dependencies can be seen in, in this framework by conditioning, conditioning by the history that will change the distribution of the present. 
So, okay, just uh, remind you, so the original uh, um, DLVM, sorry, that's a horrible acronym, so uh, deep latent variable model. So the original deep latent variable model, such as VAE, is not identifiable due to the, uh, because, uh, uh, because, for example, because of the rotations, uh, rotation indeterminacy. So in fact, VAE is actually doing something much more like PCA. This is what you can see in the practical applications of VC, VAE. In fact, it can re it, it easily, it, it is quite good in reducing the dimension of your data in a nonlinear way. Like in fact, autoencoders have been doing since the 1980s or something. But it doesn't really do ICA in the sense that it doesn't find the original independent components. It is not identifiable. But so what we do is, is this condition, when we do this conditioning, we can actually solve this problem. So we assume that we observe another auxiliary variable u, which doesn't actually have to be a random variable. It could be that something like the time index, or it could be just the history uh, of the same time series. And uh, we assume now, so the, the crucial point in the model definition is that the independent components are conditionally independent given this auxiliary variable. And now assuming that uh, not only there is this conditional independence, but also the, condi the, the conditioning U actually changes the distributions strongly enough, then we can actually prove that this, this leads to an identifiable form of deep latent variable models. And what we proposed is an algorithm or well, a, a framework and an algorithm called IVAE, so identifiable VAE, uh, which uses this idea. The estimation method is the algorithm, uh, the objective functions and so on, they are actually very closely related to original VAE, kind of reasonably simple, uh, reasonably simple modifications where we just include this condition. But well, then the identifiability, identifiability theory is, is quite sophisticated, quite, quite complicated. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's the main thrust of this paper. Okay, and, and briefly, I will just mention uh, a couple of alternative approaches or kind of further work that we have done for in this deep latent variable uh, model case. Now, in uh, above, I, I, I explained this idea, this model where we have noise, added noise. Uh, so x equals x equals f of s plus noise. But we don't actually need the noise necessarily. Like in the earlier methods with TCL, PCL, we didn't have any noise, which then kind of necessitate the assumption that the number of uh, independent components equals the number of uh, uh, observed variables. In fact, um, this kind of models have been used in a slightly different context without any kind of identifiability, without worrying about identifiability. Uh, in, in basically, in the, in the case of uh, flow models and related stuff, you can, in fact, you can model, you can formulate the likelihood of this kind of a model rather easily. Uh, algebraically, it's very easy. Uh, you just have, yeah, you have the uh, prior distributions of the components with, out, uh, with the estimates, but then you have this quite actually, well, simple looking, but computationally quite horrible term where you have the logarithm of the determinant of the Jacobian of the whole neural network. So this is extremely difficult to compute. That is actually at least, uh, um, the, uh, well, has been the opinion so far. And people working, in, working on this topic have basically given up the, uh, any attempt to evaluate this in general. So they greatly simplify G basically by saying it has some kind of a triangular structure and then you can actually ma maximize this likelihood and in a sense solve this problem. But it's not, you are not solving it for any kind of any, in any generality for any, any general F. And that is of course not even the goal of but so what we have proposed recently is that using uh, an approach called relative gradient, which is kind of a special case of the natural gradient, or well, related to the typical uh, way the natural gradient is usually used, you can actually optimize this and you can actually solve the nonlinear ICA problem in this kind of a noise-free model 
by when you, uh, once you add the conditioner here so that you get an identifiable one. But you can actually solve the problems that people want to solve with flow models, such as density estimation, in a much more general way by using this approach. Okay, and then, okay, one question that uh, almost always pops up uh, in this kind of context is that, well, is it really necessary to assume that the components are independent? Well, sometimes, of course, independence is exactly what you need. Like in blind source separation, it is often kind of the very definition of the sources. In disentanglement, some people think it is actually kind of the very definition of what, you, what disentanglement means, while others disagree. In any case, in very recent work, we have actually generalized the whole framework, and in particular, the identifiability, uh, to a case where the components are allowed to have certain kinds of dependencies. And we also make the link to energy-based modeling. So we actually have see that we have many different kind of estimation frameworks here. So we have the VAEs, energy-based modeling, self-supervised learning, and this kind of noise-free likelihood. Yeah, so uh, yeah, and kind of perhaps we will figure out some, some new ones uh, as well. So there's a question, in the DVLM case, when you condition on U, do you still need to assume that dimensionality of S and X are the same? No, no, we don't. So uh, in this framework here, where we basically use VAE uh, and condition, then we don't need to assume that. And in particular, we can do uh, the ICA and the dimension reduction as typical in VAEs at the same time. Now, in fact, if we assume that the number of components is larger than the number of observed variables, then in fact, I don't know what happens. But at least we can combine PCA and ICA uh, in, the same, in, in the same model in the IVA. Okay, so that was actually all. So uh, to conclude, so typically deep learning needs some kind of targets, such as class labels. But if there are no class labels or no targets, then we get into this realm of uh, unsupervised learning. Independent component analysis in the linear case is a very principled approach for doing this <clears throat> that we know. And now the point here is to show that it can actually be made nonlinear. That has been kind of main topic in our research for, uh, in, in the, for the last five years. Now, the key point here is that it can be made nonlinear while retaining identifiability, which is really the key property of ICA, which means that we can actually recover the original components that actually created the data in contrast to methods like ordinary PCA, PCA or VAE. Now, in order to achieve this identifiability, <coughs> we need some special assumptions. Uh, certainly, there's a huge amount of possibilities that you can actually do here. So this list is just the three cases that we have figured out so far, but I'm sure there's a lot to do here. So uh, first we propose that you could have non-stationarity, components could be non-stationary, which this was the case of time contrastive learning, Second, we assume that there might be temporal dependencies in the components while they are stationary, which led to the case of permutation contrastive learning. Or then in a more general setting, we assume that there's some kind of an auxiliary variable that conditions the distributions, uh, which then lead, led to this IVAE framework and, and algorithm. Uh, maybe I take the question here now. Um, for the dependent component discovery, can they be assumed to be a function of some higher dimensional independent sources? Um, higher dimensional. Um, maybe you mean like higher order independent sources, something that's a kind of on a higher level in some hierarchical model. Is that what you mean actually? Or do you mean really higher dimensional? Uh, well, in any case, I can give perhaps the answer to, most, uh, to both cases. Um, well, in the linear case, we often, we, there are some models where, yes, the uh, 
the components are dependent because they are actually functions of a kind of a higher level in a hierarchical model. Um, I think that could be done here in the nonlinear case as well, but we haven't done that in our case. In our case, well, certainly uh, this dependent uh, component case is something, again, something like it, it's a vast topic. So we just have like one particular uh, proposal at the moment. And in our case, what it actually is, it's something about like saying that the dependencies are stationary while the, uh, while the data is in general non-stationary. So, uh, so we can kind of, so the dependencies in a sense don't bother uh, TCL because they are stationary. Uh, they are the same in all segments. So that, that's kind of the basic idea. But yeah, it's just one idea of proposing independent, comp uh, sorry, of proposing dependent component discovery. It's something that actually comes quite easily from the maths. So that's why we propose it. Um, uh, well, okay, so if, if, the, if the question were really uh, some higher dimensional independent sources, I, that I don't actually know. Uh, higher uh, yeah, I, that I, I cannot answer that question. Uh, but, but again, um, yeah, many things are probably possible. So we have just like one proposal. Okay, uh, another question was uh, yeah. for DVLM conditioned on U, is the number of independent components identifiable? Ah, um, I think it most probably is, but I don't know if we actually have proven it. I, I'm actually not completely certain whether we have such a proof in some appendix of our very long paper. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't quite know the answer there. Okay, uh, now, uh, because the people, people are making a lot of questions, so let me first finish the uh, talk. I, the conclusion is not completely finished yet. Okay, so we, uh, yeah, so by some of these special assumptions, we can actually find identifiability. And so, okay, so I didn't actually tell you why we use, use self-supervised methods. Well, there's kind of two reasons for that. One is that somehow they are kind of easy to intuitively, heuristically develop. It's kind of often easy to figure out some kind of self-supervised method. That's kind of how we started the whole, the whole research. We figured out heuristically a self-supervised learning method, which turned out to work well. And then we analyzed it and found that it was nonlinear ICA. But um, so that's kind of a kind of a historical remark. But the real utility of self-supervised methods at this point of research is that they are really easy to implement. Implement because well, you just need to program ordinary logistic regression in an ordinary neural network. So this it's like almost trivial to do actually if you just know uh, how to program neural networks. Okay, uh, and yes, okay, so um, we also made this connection to these uh, deep latent variable models. We, and in particular, we showed how they can be non-identifiable. Actually, most of them proposed so far, I think they are non-identifiable. People haven't really paid attention to that, that question at all. But we showed that they can be made identifiable uh, in this, uh, which led, led to this IVA. And so, <clears> the <throat> last point, um, kind of the bottom, bottom line here, is that we get a principled framework for disentanglement. Disentanglement is often full of very heuristic ideas and so on. Here, we have a very rigorous probabilistic framework with a probabilistic formulation of the problem, identifiability proof, and then we use all kinds of probabilistic, uh, we can use all kinds of probabilistic uh, principled methods such as likelihood, so maximum likelihood to estimate the model, even though sometimes we resort to uh, a heuristic self supervised Okay, so maybe um, since nobody's going to applaud anyway, maybe I will go uh, to the questions. Can you please explain about importance of doing first PCA, then ICA? Uh, oh, thank you for the applause. Um, well, um, well, so this is completely kind of a, a empirical. Uh, when people do ICA in the linear case, 
so in the linear case, we have a lot of empirical experience of how it works. And what people tend to find that, uh, well, the number of kind of meaningful independent components in the data is often less than the number of, uh, uh, of, um, of the observed data variables. So in, in most applications, almost, almost all applications, although not necessarily all of them. So then you run into the question that how do you do ICA so that you actually get a smaller number of components? Now, you could formulate a nice probabilistic model for that, and people have done that, for sure. But what people find that uh, find works in practice very well is that you first reduce the dimension by ordinary PCA and then do ICA in that subspace. Um, you will always find people who say that that is not rigorous, that is not principled, and so on and so on. But it, it just seems to work in practice. And nobody has really shown empirically that you would get really good results by some principled probabilistic formulation that combines PC and ICA. Uh, unfortunately, it would actually be nice if somebody had that, but uh, it hasn't really happened. So now the question is that how, whether, whether this logic um, applies in the nonlinear case. Well, in the nonlinear case, we have very little empirical uh, experience of any kind, so we don't really know. It, it, is, it is possible that uh, we could do nonlinear ICA, uh, we could combine nonlinear ICA with dimension reduction simply by reducing the first doing ordinary VAE to reduce the dimension and then doing nonlinear ICA in that subspace, uh, so in that manifold basically without reducing dimension any further. Uh, that's a possibility. Or it could be that uh, maybe it, would, it is better to use our IVAE that uh, combines these two. So we don't really know. We don't have enough empirical evidence to say how to do it. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? I guess um, I'm not sure. Actually, my question uh, was addressed on. Um, because the formulation of the self-supervised learning path seems to be uh, crucial to the type of dependence one can resolve. Um, and I guess uh, he was wondering if there's a way of, uh, in general, designing the self-supervised task itself for the specific structure. Uh, so, sorry, I didn't quite get that. That's a question, right? Uh, I, sorry. I, okay, so yeah, that question was from Jeremiah's. Um, the question is basically how do we design the self-supervised learning task to account for the structure? Um, uh, well, then there is no principled way for doing that. So self-supervision, it's always completely heuristic. Just You just think about the problem. I mean, you think about the structure of the data and what think about stuff that might be might be reasonable. So it's, yeah, so I, this, it's, it's really completely heuristic and com completely based on intuition. So, so that's why, I mean, the fact that I started with uh, self-supervised learning and ended up with nonlinear ICA, it, it's kind of a coincidence, really. Uh, there's no logical reason why the self-supervised learning should lead to anything like, like nonlinear ICA. Uh, yeah. So, in some future version of this talk, I, this is something I've been thinking about: whether I should actually talk, start talking about this self-supervised learning at all. I could start by a probabilistic formulation of two models for nonlinear ICA, then I can talk about maximum likelihood estimation, uh, possibly using uh, the elbow, which leads to VAE, and just mention maybe self-supervised learning as one alternative. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of possible. Uh, but at the same time, self-supervised learning, it's, it's kind of fun. I mean, people do it a lot, really a lot in computer vision because it is, um, it has it has the advantage of uh, well being at well at least it has the advantage of being reasonably simple to implement and well maybe also it may also have the advantage that you can then change the models uh, the the methods uh, maybe you can adapt them more easily to different to new kinds of situations while probabilistic models may be a little bit more more difficult. I'm, I'm not actually sure about, I'm not actually quite sure about that, but um, 
but but the case could be made that we could completely forget about these uh, these self-supervised methods and just talk about just talk about like high-level uh, probabilistic theory, rigorous probabilistic theory of nonlinear ICA. Uh, that, that would be another approach to this problem because uh, really there's, there's a little bit of a logical contradiction between talking about rigorous probabilistic theory on the one hand and self-supervised learning on the other hand in, in the same talk. Um, yeah. but, but that's kind of just how we happen to start this research. Thank you. Um, and there's another question uh, yes. from Philip Hanno. Um, how does IVAE compare to volume regularized non negative matrix factorization? Volume regularized NMF. Um, I'm sorry, I don't actually know that method. No, I don't know. There was another question uh, is there code for this? Um, yes, there's various kinds of code. We have at least for TCL code. Um, IVA, I, I'm, not, I'm not actually completely certain whether we have already code for IVAE. Uh, if you email the first author, I think he will probably send you some, but certainly we are at least, at the very least, we are in the process of putting a code on the web. It will certainly be there reasonably soon. Okay, so clarification NM is non deterministic and non unit minimizing. Um, uh, right, so, um, well, okay, so I, I would assume that NMF is uh, usually um, always linear. I, I'm not aware of any nonlinear versions of NMF. So from that viewpoint, then the question would be that what is the connection between ICA and NMF? Well, that's an interesting question, in fact. So what is the connection between linear ICA and NMF? That's an interesting question and, um, well, one approach is that, well, of course, NMF is completely non-probabilistic, at least in its basic formulation. It doesn't have, it's not a statistical model. Um, it, um, its identifiability has been studied to uh, some detail. And basically the identifiability theory seems to be rather difficult and uh, weaker than in ICA. Uh, yeah, it, it seems to work empirically in, in, in certain applications, but I, I would say it's basically a rather heuristic method at, at least at this stage, and perhaps by its very nature, because it's not formulated from a probabilistic viewpoint. There are also, it's possible, it's, it's perfectly possible to combine NMF with ICA. That is, uh, take the idea of the assumptions of non-negativity, and put them as part of the ICA model uh, with, uh, while retaining the probabilistic formulation of the ICA model. Uh, that has been done um, by various authors. Uh, for example, there's the uh, NMF with sparseness constraints. Um, I would actually write here NMF with sparseness constraints. Yeah, but in the nonlinear case, in the deep learning case, I, I don't know if NMF is, is used in any way. Perhaps it is, but I am not aware of it. All right, um, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Apple for the very thoughtful working talk.